Hello again everyone, welcome back to PTech Chemistry channel. So in this tutorial video, I'll go through specifically this Cambridge International 9701 practical syllabus. This is for paper 3 practical. This is for the 2022 syllabus onwards. So it's very important that students have gone through the syllabus document itself because there are some changes here and there and it's so often that the highlighted changes, well they don't highlight it but you know, the, the, the new additions, the stuff that should be emphasized are the stuff that students will have missed out on. So practicals are a big component of chemistry uh, curriculum obviously, it's what I advocate for. Uh, however, we know that COVID last year and the year before have, re have really robbed students of these opportunities to do practicals, but there are some countries that couldn't exempt the students from these uh, practical uh, requirements, the paper tree requirements these days. It's also partly important because you need it in your paper five, experimental planning and design, because if you have never done the actual practical before, if you've never done them in IGCS or all level chemistry, and now you haven't really done them in AS level chemistry and you're expected to go to university and do science courses without having done practicals. It's not very uh, practical at all, okay? So no pun intended there. Um, anyway, let's just jump on onto this. So we know that paper three is a two hour timetable paper. Of course, you know, students will know what is going to come out. But what I can assure you is that whatever comes out will be from the syllabus. It must have been stated in the syllabus because that is how examiners would have you know, prepare your question paper in advance. So you need to involve manipulating, measurement and observations. So these things are the easier bit usually because, you know, you are just doing the practical except that you need to keep an eye out on decimal places, observations, you need to talk about color, all the color changes when you add a little bit, when you add in excess, so you know, add dropwise versus added in excess, and of course, all those tests for guesses, if they are guesses, or any other observation you see, to be honest. The most difficult thing really is about analysis, conclusion, and evaluation. So the second bit there is not actually that bad because this is about tables, so tabulations. This is about uh, graphing. So this is about analysis of your, well, not analysis, but you know, just making sure that your results are outlined clearly and properly and also in detail because a lot of students thought they are writing a marking scheme when they don't even have a marking scheme next to them in the real exam, okay? Now, the very last thing here, analysis, conclusion, evaluation. These things are to do with error analysis. So very commonly asked, you can have a look at my error analysis uh, short tutorial videos and then you can be asked on the identities. So what are the identities of the cations, anions, all the gases present, evaluation, whether it's accurate or not. So you have accuracy, but you also have something called reliability. So accuracy is to do with well, how accurate is the data? But you know, reliability is to do with how um, reliable. I find like I'm, I'm in a rounded argument here. Um, uh, this circular argument will not work. Okay, reliability is to do with if you repeat the experiments, can you get the same result? Okay, accuracy means uh, are you very close to the actual value? All right, so that is basically accuracy. And blah, blah, blah. So paper three will consist of two or three questions. So do not expect it to always be, you know, uh, three questions. It could be two questions. But what is very important is manage your time wisely. Manage your time wisely. It so happened that most of the time, you spend quite a lot of time on the actual action, which is the actual practical itself. Uh, but then you actually need some time as well on, you know, thinking about the data, tabulating them, and of course, thinking about the analysis as well. What else? Uh, there will definitely be an observational problem. This is to do with qualitative analysis. Qualitative. Qualitative means it's something to do not with numbers, but with the general idea of observation. And you're trying to analyze the presence of ions. But it's not just that because the substances may be elements, may be compounds, may be mixtures. You could have a mixture of compounds where you have more than one ion. You could have elements or you could have pure compounds, which can include organic which can include organic compounds as well. And these are all as stated in the syllabus as I'll show you in a little bit, okay? What else? Um, the other questions are quantitative. 
quantitative means something to do with quantity so this is numerical this is to do with uh, calculations so it could be a titration it could be a measurement of a quantity such as heat you know mc delta t such as gravimetric gravimetric means something to do with masses so you know from the name itself you heat it up to constant mass perhaps to drive away the water crystallization and you could be talking about rate rate of reaction so that is to do with the time that you're measuring the temperature that you're measuring that allows you to calculate heat energy and then the mass the mass loss when you heat up uh, compounds that can decompose or that can remove the water crystallization or gas volume this is using like a inverted measuring cylinder and yeah, not necessarily just a measuring cylinder in a water trout it could also be a burette inverted inside a water trout or it could even be a gas syringe which is you know suitable for collecting gas that might be uh, dissolved in water or they might be soluble in water one or more of the question may I require candidates comment on the accuracy of the procedure this is something to do with the numbers usually so qualitative analysis we don't really measure how much volume we added typically but accuracy of the data the procedure procedure meaning the method is typically associated with the qualitative bit of the question of course we are the biggest sources of errors and then make suggestion for improvement how do you improve on them so be very careful they usually talk about the procedure they don't talk about the human error so be very careful about that We'll talk about the apparatus requirements in a little bit. So there's all the apparatus requirements. So from the apparatus requirement, you can roughly guess what kind of uh, experiment will come up. That, but one of those things is that you will never know what are the apparatus requirements for the actual exam itself because those are confidential info and you shouldn't. You shouldn't really try to find out what's going to come out. In fact, you should really try to go through every single little bit stated in the syllabus because whatever stated in the syllabus, that is going to be the one that's going to come out. You just are. You just prepare for you know all the eventual outcomes. You just don't know which one's going to come out. So do not try to take your chance in guessing. Expectations for each of these skills. You obviously need to know how to set up apparatus. If you don't even know how to use a pipette or a burette, you are going to have problems. Now you have to follow instructions. One of the worst questions will be in the rate of reaction questions. I think there was one particular question where you have to mix many 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 things together it's like the order really matter the order of uh, mixing based on question really really matters how about titration questions where sometimes you could have some indicators you never used before but you know they can have uh, they might have specified the color changes in the question itself that kind of stuff yeah so use apparatus to collect appropriate quantity of data this word there appropriate so appropriate there refers to the number of significant figures. So significant figures is to do with the accuracy of the apparatus. So you need to know temperature is measured to 0 0.0 or 0.5 degrees Celsius. Your typical mass balance in the laboratory, typical is two decimal place, but of course it depends on the mass balance in front of you that you use, okay? As a try, as a try, uh, burette volume is to two decimal place as well, 0 0.05 or 0 0.10 or something like that. Now make observations, make observations, and observations include differences in color. So you have to say from something to something. Solubility, is it dissolved or not? And if it does dissolve, what color does it become? Does it become colorless solution or does it become a color solution specified? Quantity of materials, do you have lesser, or do you have more of the materials, something like that? Color of the materials after you heat it, for instance, etc., etc. This one is about the appropriate number of significant figures. You will see that what I mentioned, temperature to the nearest 0.5 degrees Celsius, burette has to be two decimal place without any mistake at all, something 0 0.05 or something 0 0.10. And what else? Mm, calibration of temperature. So the intervals of one degree Celsius, meaning you read it to 0.5 degrees Celsius. Burette readings, the interval of 0 0.1 cm cube. Therefore, the accuracy is plus minus 0 0.05 cm cube for a single reading etc etc now some candidates may be unable to set up the apparatus they can ask for assistance however this assistance should not go beyond the minimum necessary to enable candidates to take some readings remember it will not be your teacher who will be in the room with you as you know supervisor themselves they are not allowed to be in the same room as the students so therefore you'll be asking a, 
a foreign person, someone you don't know, and um, depending on how friendly that person is, you might or might not get that assistance. So you know, you need to make sure that you are aware of all the apparatus that you're expected to use as stated in the syllabus. Quality of measurements or observations, you gotta achieve concordant titles. So concordant titles must be within 0.10 cn cube of each other because each of your reading was 0 0.05 cn cube accuracy. So you cannot have greater than two times readings, final and initial there. Precise color descriptions. So you gotta say from something to something. So specify everything. Do not take chances because you don't know about the marking scheme. There is no marking scheme next to you. Do not try and guess. Instead, work systematically. That is the job of a chemist. Uh, what else? Decision relating to measurements or observations. This is part of decision making. In fact, the first thing you need to decide in a practical exam is to decide the time. If you think the practical attack is going to take a long time, you need to speed up a little bit, but not at the expense of bad handwriting or at the expense of dirtying your question paper or at the expense of not writing in your data in pen straight away. This is about titrations or how many tests or observations you need to perform. Sometimes you need to repeat. Why do you need to repeat? So that to confirm. But sometimes you don't have time to repeat, so you need to make sure that whatever you do for the first time, you can get the correct observations. This is the next one. It's about um, you know choosing a range, like let's say uh, choosing choosing uh, concentrations or choosing volumes for serial dilution. If you never heard of serial dilution, you should watch my tutorial videos. I was for paper three and paper five. It's to do with dilution, whether you're diluting from a stock solution. So this thing called stock or standard solution, it means a solution of known concentration. So if you know the concentration, that means you can further dilute it with just uh, the change of varying the volume of water and the volume of this uh, stock solution keeping the total volume constant, of course, and then you get a series of uh, different concentrations of the solutions. They get further and further diluted. Of course, you could also have started from the solid, then you have started from solid into solution. So all the solid is made up into the solution, and this is making our stock solution. So the molder is going to be the same because all the solid goes into the solution. So you have the mole of the solid, which is the mass of MR, and you have the mole of the solution, which is concentration time volume. Do not forget your concentration is in mole per dm cube, and your volume will have to be in dm cube as a result of the unit, and you have to cancel out the unit so you have to divide any cn cube by dm cube then. To do this kind of uh, stock solution preparation, you need an accurate apparatus. You need something called volumetric pipette. Sorry, not volumetric pipette, volumetric flask because you need to make up the solution in a volumetric flask of a known quantity depending on how much of the stock solution you want to prepare. For this making of a stock solution via serial dilution, you need something accurate, something like a burette would be very accurate because you're starting from a solution and you are preparing a more dilute solution there. The next one is about uh, where, where would you want to repeat readings or observations. So, you know, about uh, heat, heat transfer. So those enthalpy changes, if you repeat them once or twice, you can ensure that your results are more reliable, reliability whether you can reproduce the same result if you do them again. You can also improve accuracy uh, by you know doing a couple of times and taking averages. So what else can I say? Uh, temperature, and then you have titration where you have to do a couple of times until you get consistent titers within plus minus 0.10 cn cube for your tick because you tick only the best titers that are within this range there. What else? Um, select reagents to distinguish between given ions. So you need to know your table. So it's only two pages table, two or three pages. So these are your table of tasks. And just because you are given in paper three does not mean that you need to go in not knowing the table. You have to go in prepared to know the table. Otherwise, you will run out of time, obviously. And of course, if you know about the reagents, you will better understand the underlying uh, reactions that happened. And therefore, you can understand or you can decide what kind of confirmatory tests that you need to do furthermore in order to you know, decide on the nature of such ions. 
The next one is on presentation of daytime observations. Make sure that you have units. So you do a stroke and then the units, or you can do them in bracket, or you can write them saying volume in CNQ. But you have to label. Label are important. Label are basically who you are, who you want to present yourself to the examiner, not as someone sloppy, but as someone who knows what they are doing. As a competent scientist, as a competent chemist, you need to label not just for yourself, but also to show other people that you're competent in what you do. And what else, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, what else can I say, blah, blah, blah. I think the rest of it should be all right. Um, you can't, you can use, you can use conventional symbols or you can use abbreviations because you are in paper three practicals. You are not allowed to use abbreviation in theory paper. So we can use delta H for enthalpy change. We can use PPT for precipitate. Those are stated here in the syllabus for the 2022 uh, syllabus onwards. In fact, they have always been stated in the syllabus document that these are all right to begin with. Display of calculations and reasoning. So here, this is one of those things that are very important in qualitative analysis, sorry, quantitative analysis, something to do with the numbers. So please, whatever you do, do not come up with magic numbers, show your working. It's one of those things that examiners are not trying to penalize you. They try to give you the marks, but don't just show the working for the sake of showing the working. Show it so that you can follow the units. So follow units, do not make any mistakes. Follow the math and then do not write equal. Equal means equal. So if you don't mean equal, do not use the, the, the sign equal there unless you're doing the exact same thing, you know, to show the right hand side is equal to the left hand side like that, okay? Now use the correct number of significant figures for calculated quantities. This should be the same, the same as or one more than the smallest number of significant figure in the provided experimentally determined data. So look in the data given. Look in the data given. So usually, I think in theory paper, I already mentioned something about appropriate number of significant figures a lot of times. So this is about your decision makings and the presentations of your data following your calculation. It has to be roughly the same number of significant figures as the data given. That's what I usually tend to follow. But they also say it can be one more than the smallest number. Usually, I don't do that. I usually just keep to the same number of significant figures as the data provided. For instance, this is your one, two, three, and four significant figures. So your calculator concentration could be one, two, three, and four significant figures, or you could give it to three significant figures because usually, other than the volume of the titration, the volume of title, you also have other concentration data, which would be have been given to three significant figures. So three or four should have been all right there. Data layout. So there is no one specific way on doing this. Some people, I will say, let's say gravimetric analysis. So you have, let's say, mass of empty crucible, and then you have mass of crucible plus the solid before heating. So let's say mass of crucible plus X before heating. And then you have mass of crucible plus X after heating. So some people, you would put in the per gram, that means you put in the unit there, that's perfectly fine. Uh, some of you would draw tables, very nice tables with the lines, that is perfectly fine. You will see from my tutorial, usually I rarely draw the lines because I present my data horizontally with some space in between so that everything is clearly laid out. And as long as you present your data in a clear manner, whether you draw the lines in a table or not, it shouldn't matter. You don't get marks for the table, but you do get marks for a clear presentation of data with all the head Things with all the levels as well as the units. Now I put the units there, but then some people like to put in the units like on here in gram. So you know they just write down blah 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 blah. That is perfectly fine as well. Or you can do you know the other way around, which is per gram per gram. That is what I normally do. So you know perfectly up to you. Now draw an appropriate table. So in advance because you need to read the question. When you read the questions, you can plan. You can plan what sort of readings, what readings you need. You would have done all the practicals associated in this syllabus anyway. So, you know, it's not like you would never have done the practicals. I hope, all right? Um, but yeah, record all the data on the table as you do the practical. As you do the practical, do not try and use pencils. Do, do in ink straight away because you might not have time to come back to them. 
Now you gotta plot appropriate variables on appropriate clearly labeled x and y axis. This is to do with graphical questions. So you know it's stated in the syllabus that you could be asked something on graph, and graph points should be drawn using a sharp pencil. Do not go into the exam with a blunt pencil, so make sure you have a sharpener and sharpen it. And do a cross, so use a cross to plot your data. The reason why they ask you for a cross is because when you do a dot and when they scan the paper, your dot might be too small for them to see your point and therefore it might be difficult for you to get the marks at all. Okay, so don't use dot, use cross instead. And don't use ink, use pencil to plot your graph. And what else? Um, graph lines and graph points, make sure you can draw them. If it, if it is a straight line, make sure you use a ruler. If it is a curve, make sure you try to draw the curve properly instead of just connecting the dots. This is clearly labeled x and y axis. This is together with units. Make sure you have together with units following your table headings or following whatever they ask you to draw. Choose the scale. This is decision. This is one of the hardest thing of all because this is something that, you know, in paper five, they have taken out this component. So it's out of paper five. When I say out of paper five, I mean, they no longer give you the marks for choosing the scale in paper five because they now just give you two marks in paper five planning paper because they already provided the scale on the X and the Y as well as the labels. So they only give you two marks for plotting in the data and the trend. But in paper three, in paper three, they will not give you everything. In paper three practical, it will probably be a four to five marks question and four to five marks out of 40, what do they expect you to do? Axis, labels, then choose your scale, choose your scale properly. So those itself are really worth half the marks and then the other half the marks will be on plotting, plotting as well as trend line. So you know, that is how these are usually worth two marks and then these are usually worth two marks. So overall could be four to five marks like that. So plot all your points using cross or circle dots. The reason why they ask you to use circle dot is because like I said, the dot is really, really small. It might be really hard for the examiners to see on the screen. Most papers these days are scanned and they are marked on screen by people around the world. So what you want to do really is, I prefer to use cross instead of dot, but you could have used a circle dot to form that to appropriate accuracy. Make sure you can read graph very, very quickly. If you lack this skill, you should practice reading a couple of graphs. There are practice papers in paper five. So you can do some paper five. Question number two, which is on data analysis and plotting graph. Practice them to see how fast you can plot some graph. Okay. Now draw straight line or smooth curve, depending on the trend of a graph. Remember, a line of best fit could mean that it could be a straight line. It could also be a curve there. Last but not least, the most difficult component of a practical paper, analysis, conclusion, and evaluation. So depending on your table, depending on your graph, you can see uh, as something increases, as something increases or decreases going down the table, uh, something else would also blah, blah, blah. So, you know, this thing here, this is called describe. Describe what happens when this increase, what happened on this thing here. So you need to describe properly. Do not just use one word, increase, decrease, higher, lower. Doesn't work like that. Description mean as something changes, what happened to the other thing. This is usually the X axis because we change the X axis. We change the, we change the independent variable independent variable is what you change in the experiment. Typically this result in the X axis and then what you measure, what you measure is you measure the dependent variables. So the dependent variable is what you measure and this typically results in the reading for the Y axis. So your Y axis are not necessarily the dependent variable straight away, but then they are typically associated with what you measure that result in the Y axis. And this is based on what you change on the X axis, which is your independent variable. Some other factors could affect your experiment, could affect your reading, but you keep them constant. So those are called control variable. So control variables means they can affect your reading. They can affect your readings, meaning to say they can affect your y-axis reading, but you keep them constant. So you keep them not changing. And this is very important in, in rate of reaction experiment. So let's say you want to investigate. You want to investigate rate as concentration changes. And we know that there are many, many factors that could affect rate of reaction. So, you know, 
what are you changing here? What you are changing here is your concentration. So this is to change. So this is on the x-axis. This is your independent variable because you are changing the independent variable. What are you measuring? Well, in the lab, you will not measure rate. Instead, what you measure is you measure time. You measure time using stopwatch. There is no instrument to measure rate. You measure time using stopwatch and then you can convert you can convert this into rate because rate is inversely proportional to time. So you can take the reciprocal one divided by time and can get rate plotted on the y-axis, concentration on the x-axis there. So you know time is going to be time is what you measure. So if you measure time, so time is going to be your dependent variable. So they are not exactly on your y-axis, but one over time is on your y-axis because you manipulate the data to give you the rate of reaction, which you measure time, and then you could get the rate based on the reciprocal there. But there are other factors that could affect rate. So you will keep, you will keep temperature constant, you will keep surface area if you involve a solid constant. So you know, temperature is one of those things that can affect rate of reaction. So that is what you call the control variable. But of course, as your objective, as your objective differs, if you want to investigate rate based on changing temperature, then obviously temperature becomes the independent variable is what you change, and then you will keep concentration constant. Uh, therefore, concentration will become the control variable in the different set of experiments. For these things, you can watch my experimental tutorial playlist on the factors affecting rate of reaction. Yes, they were from my uh, teaching materials for the O level or the IGCSE or the GCSE level chemistry contents. But of course, you know, practical is practical and the associated concepts, they are still related to AS as well as A level chemistry. Uh, what else can I tell you? So what do we have here? Describe and summarize key points of a set of observations. So you could be asked to summarize what do you what can you conclude, you know, from this list of observations. And uh, when you do mean from repeated values, so this could be from titration, this could be from gravimetric analysis, this could be from uh, calorimetry. Calorimetry is to do with heat changes, delta H, that kind of stuff, blah, blah, blah. Now find an unknown value by using coordinates, a point of intersection or intercepts. So we know about this in thermometric titration. This is part of calorimetry. Without doing, you know, final volume, initial volume, you are just mixing things together and generating out the change in temperature. This is a, this is actually a 14 to 16 years old practical question. And I have done this practical as an experimental tutorial in my experimental tutorial playlist. It's also a AS level questions come up before. Of course, you could also use these as in the calorimetry. You know, you extrapolate the graph such that you get these um, kind of calorimetry questions. So initial, 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 and then boom, suddenly your temperature increases and then you extrapolate the graph like that. And then you extrapolate the graph like that. And this is where you added in the stuff. So, you know, where they intersect, where they intersect them, that is going to be the highest temperature. This is for a exothermic reaction, TF, TI. So that thing there is going to be delta t so this is your delta t mc delta t give you your heat transfer to the solution there of course there could be many other kind of graph intersection depending on what the question wants you to do but very very importantly gradient of a straight line graph we know a straight line graph from lower secondary mathematics y equal to mx plus c this is your y-axis your M is your gradient because a straight line graph has a constant gradient. Your X is your X axis. And what is the C then? The C is the Y intercept. So sometimes we have to consider what happened when X equal to zero. Is the Y zero or does it have a Y intercept? If it is zero, why is it zero? Think about what happened when X equal to zero. What are you collecting on the Y axis? What are you reading? but sometimes it has a y-intercept. Also think about what happened when x equal to zero. Why does it have a y-intercept? Always think about the practical scenario. When you have a graph, you need to use more than half. You need to use more than half, you see? This one must be more than half of the actual paper. If you have this whole 
well, this is like a horizontal screen, but you know, more than half would mean like you probably fill up this much. So if you have an A4 sheet, such as half of this size, you really want to use, you know, more than half of the craft paper rather than using very small bit of it. You want to ensure your craft is nice and big there. Next last bit, next last point, next last point is actually on extra polishing. Extra polish was basically what I did here. I extended the line so that I can get this line which is an estimated position because when I added in the solid, I cannot measure the maximum temperature rise and therefore I have to extrapolate it by extrapolating the data that I collected probably half a minute or one minute after I added in that particular solid in this exothermic reaction. That is called extrapolation. Last but not least, you can involve calculations on mean, percentage, Percentage gain or loss, this is to do with gravimetric analysis where you have gained some mass if you get oxidized in the air, you combine with oxygen in the air, or you lose some mass as you decompose and give out gas. For example, calcium carbonate, magnesium carbonate, they can give out carbon dioxide and so on and so forth. Rate of reaction, concentration, molar mass and volume of gases. This is to do with gas collection. One of the surprising things that came out, I think in the 2016 syllabus, there was the last time when there was a big change in the uh, 9701 syllabus, they started introducing this thing called gas collection and that was in the new syllabus back then so you know, new stuff does get tested, alright, that's what I'm saying. Oof, quite a lot of things, yeah, drawing conclusions, so make sure uh, when you want to conclude something, you have evidence, make sure you have evidence, this is called, you know, working based on evidence, we don't just say a person is guilty, so we need to present evidence 1, evidence 2, evidence 3. So you say something is present, what is your evidence? Do not, do not base it on something you don't see. If you don't see it, try to test for it. That's why you have a table on the test for cations, anions, etc, etc. Test for gases as well, yeah? So blah, 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 blah. Maybe required to prove or disprove a hypothesis. So it could be said that this student thinks that the percentage uh, yield is 90%. Then you do the titration and then you get a value. Is the percentage yield 90%? above 90% or lesser than 90%, so you have to prove or disprove yes or not, and then show your data. This is using evidence, deduction from the data, observations, all your calculated values. Like I said just now, percentage yield, you know, uh, something say, this drug contains 5% iron, you know, iron supplement. It contains 5% iron. Show by using titration, does it contain 5% iron or not, etc, etc. One of those uh, common problems in titration, yeah? Last bit, uh, I keep on saying last bit, but I think this is really the last bit actually. So part of analysis is thinking about the sources of error and how can you improve on them. Are you effective at doing this control variable? Remember I mentioned control variable? So control variables are factors that can't affect your reading. They can affect your dependent variable. So the readings to be measured are your dependent variables, but you don't want them to because you are just changing one thing at one time. So other variables are just to be kept constant, which is why you, know, you call them control variable, depending on the objective of your experiment. Comments on the errors intrinsic in measuring devices. I mentioned this in my short tutorial video on error analysis, so do check them out. So these are often the calculations. Do you have a single reading or do you have double reading? So how many readings do you need in order to get to whatever you're measuring? Okay, single readings or two readings. So I'll give you an example. For instance, you have intervals of uh, temperature. So your intervals of temperature will be one degree Celsius uh, interval for your thermometer in the laboratory. So therefore, your error in a single reading is going to be your smallest interval. So this is in a single reading. Your smallest interval is one degree Celsius. You divide that by two, you get 0 0.5 degrees Celsius. So this is the error in a single reading is plus minus 0 0.5 degrees Celsius. Now, of course, we know also that uh, when we do initial temperature and final temperature, final temperature, initial temperature, so you know, final temperature has a plus minus 0.5 degrees Celsius, initial temperature has a plus minus 0.5 degrees Celsius. So when you calculate delta T, this is from two readings of temperature. These are from two single readings of temperature. Therefore, your percentage error in your delta T is going to be 0 0.5 degrees Celsius, which is for one single reading, but you need to multiply by two because you needed two 
different readings in order to generate the delta t, tf minus ti. So that thing multiplied by 2, error in a single reading multiplied by 2 divided by the reading. This will be in degrees Celsius, degrees Celsius. They will always cancel out because we are trying to work out something percentage there. You could, of course, also do similar kind of error analysis for titration volume uh, based on the title that is from the burette. And then you could also do not just that, also gravimetric to do with the use of mass balance. All of that are outlined in the error analysis tutorial video. Quite a short video there. And show an understanding of the distinction between systematic error. Systematic errors to do with the errors on the equipments as well as random errors. So we can reduce random errors. We can reduce or we can decrease random errors by doing a repeated experiment. So repeat experiment, and then you can get average, provided you do not take into account the, the results that are clearly anomalous. That means wrong results. You don't take the average, of course, yeah? But systematic errors are going to be errors in the equipment. So provided you use the same equipment throughout, the same apparatus throughout. So, you know, systematic errors, they, they will be the same throughout the experiment. So they don't really affect, you know, your, your results in much as in much regards really okay so human error is not acceptable one of those things that students always write human error human error so you know they specify here not acceptable so it's very clear those students have never ever really read through the syllabus and it's very very worrying okay and it's no wonder that those students happen to be the one who score quite badly because you never make the effort to understand what the syllabus wants you to cover now identify the more significant sources of error in an experiment. So I can tell you, if, for example, in a calorimetry experiment, this is to do with heat transfer, right? We always assume 100% conservation of energy, so you could get heat loss. That is number one, that is number one uh, source of error. Of course, in gravimetric analysis, when you heat up solid, some of the solid could actually, you know, like they, they have that, they have that popping sound when you hit something to crispiness or dryness then we call them spitting out you know when you hit something in a in a crucible and then some of this solid can spit out spitting spitting of the solids when you strongly hit them so sometimes we use a lid to prevent the spitting so you know we hit loss we would insulate by using a plastic lid or a cotton wool around the container around the polystyrene cup uh, which itself is you know a very good insulator a very bad conductor but very good insulator polystyrene or styrofoam cup there this is about uncertainty. Uncertainty was basically about the percentage error. That was what I mentioned here earlier. This to do with temperature. That was exactly what I mentioned there. So I don't want to mention it again. Realistic modifications, things which you could easily do in the laboratory, and then suggest ways in order to extend the investigation to answer the new question. So this is about other methods. So for example, titration can tell you uh, concentrations, uh, of, a, of a particular unknown solution. But of course, you could also do that by uh, gas collection. If you have an acid, you can also react with carbonate or metal to give you gas. And from the volume of gas, you could also you know, work backward and get the concentration of the acid. And then you have to think about this investigation, which one is going to be more accurate. I didn't make that up. Those are just simply examples of previous paper tree practical questions that have come up. Okay, I think I'll probably stop this video here and then the next part of these practical tutorial sessions, I will go through the other experiments as stated in these uh, syllabus and there are also a list of apparatus as stated in the syllabus as well. So see you in the next tutorial video and don't get too stressed about it. It's practical, but make sure you do understand nature of practicals. See you in the next tutorial video. Thank you for watching. Don't forget, click the button on the bottom right to subscribe to my channel. Follow me at ptet.chemistry on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Telegram to get connected. And also don't forget to share the channel and this video widely with other people who might find it useful.